Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Power Homeschool <clears throat> Masterclass with Jamie Holly. How are you doing, Jamie? Excellent. Thanks for having me, Dustin. Awesome. You're welcome. Jamie's been with us <clears throat> since the early 2000s writing on Piware. Um, could you give us a little bit of background on your designing history, where you learned to write? How you got sure. started? Yeah, definitely. Um, I could expound for some great length on this, but I'll try to give you a Reader's Digest version. Um, I marched Blue Devils, marched the B Corps, marched the A Corps, uh, aged out, went and taught the Blue Coats around aged out in 94, 95, 96. I taught the Blue Coats and started teaching Key Poland's brand new high school in Clovis called Buchanan High School. Um, I love the drill stuff, so I, I went and taught visual there while I went to college at Fresno State. Uh, Jay Murphy was the drill writer, and I had always picked Jay's brain when I was marching Blue Devils. So he would just, uh, every time that we wanted to rewrite, he would just say, hey, have Jamie do it, have Jamie do it, have Jamie do it. And I started in rewrites. That was back in the day when we wrote everything by hand. So it was graph paper and pencils. And I, I'm kind of a drawing geek anyway. I wanted to be an architect, so I loved it. Awesome. Um, did that for a while, graduated high school, uh, graduated college, went and taught math at James Logan High School and started writing like three, four shows on the side to make extra cash as I think people at HR do that. Um, eventually I decided I, didn't like teaching high school math as much as I liked writing band drill and teaching band for a living. So I uh, left the high school gig and here I am, gosh, I guess 20 years later and living in Long Beach, California, writing 10 to dozen BOA shows, a couple drum corps shows, uh, three to six WGI shows, depending on how busy I want to be doing a little judging, stuff like that. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's great. I wrote by hand for a long time, switched over to power, I think in 04, um, somewhere around there. Uh, Troopers was the very first thing I had done. That was the very first drum corps gig I had been hired to write. And it was a good time of year when I didn't have a full fall schedule. So I picked that one to be the uh, the learning curve on power. Awesome. Well, let's just dive right in. What do you have for yeah. us tonight? Show us how you write. Right on. Well, um, kind of do a scatter shot here. And obviously, anytime if anybody out there has questions, feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind changing my uh, train of thought. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about props as props are kind of the, the new age thing that everybody has to have them nowadays. And, and I'm sure everybody out there has tons of band directors that are like, we got to use props. We want to use props. How do we use props? Um, you know, at the Blue Devils, which is kind of my main gig, we started doing, um, we started in props quite a while back and, and really getting into what the props were and what that meant. You know, so we had some, uh, I've had a lot of experience in what worked, what didn't work through failures and successes. So part of my thing is when I talk to a band director, it's definitely the first call, you know, it, it, when we start talking, what are you going to do here? What are you there? It's, do you want to use props? Have you used props? Mm -hmm. What do you know about using props? Um, I think I've failed enough times with props that I try to help people steer clear of problems that arise. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's certainly a lot to designing props, mm -hmm. uh, designing how to use them. And I think, you know, for me, the key is first assessing where a program is. You know, are you ready to use 20 moving props? You know, mm -hmm. do you know what that entails? And, you know, so I try to give people a good idea before we ever put anything down on paper, before we do any of that, I try to give them a, a really sh a strong idea of what it's going to involve for them, for their program, you know, come Monday at 3 p.m. when they say set it up, what does that mean? You know, are you using mm -hmm. the props every day? Do you, do, you, do you have them stored next to the field? Are they easily lugged out to the field? Do you have a crew that's going to do that? Do you have, Band dads are going to do that on Saturdays. Is band dads going to load them onto the truck when you get to the show? Who's unloading them? Do you have enough people? Uh, you know, so there's a lot of logistics that go involved, go into it. So right. that's certainly something I try to tackle right away with the fact that you know people watch shows now, and it seems every every competitively successful band has props. Mm -hmm. So going in, everybody's like, we got to use props. Uh, Power has gotten infinitely better on how you guys let us use props and design props and move props. Um, it's really come a long way, especially the, the performer prop tool that came out a couple of years ago. I mm -hmm. thought that was a game changer. Uh, but, you know, my first thing before I even design is just try to get their heads in the right place, make sure they're really aware of what that means to, to be using those props. You, uh, you said that you um, try to establish where the program is. Do you, yeah. um, as a designer, actually fly out to see them or is it more of a, a Skype meeting or how does that work for you? I think that depends mostly on the band budget and, and you know where they are in their in their development. If 
you know, if a program is, is already well established and they have a, a big budget and they fly designers in or something, we might do that. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, the first phase is probably a phone or a Skype thing, mm -hmm. uh, something along that lines. Now, Zoom, I guess it would be nowadays. Um, but yeah, it, and, and it really is kind of just asking those probing questions about have you have you used them? Did you make them? Did your boosters make them? Did you right. have a, a company make them and that kind of stuff? Understood. Great. All right. Um, yeah, I guess. Should, I, should we start talking about some designer props? Or let me let me talk real quick about, I guess, when you're deciding with directors and program coordinators and music people, um, I think the props kind of fall into a couple different areas. You have moving props, you have stationary props. Right. Moving props, are they going to move many times? Are they going to move once? Are your stationary props, are those things that you need to use every day? Are those things that you can just set up? You can paint a field on your practice field or tape an area out on the turf field where those are going to be. So it's kind of determining whether they're going to be moving things or stationary things. Right. Uh, I think one of the newer developments over the last couple of years is now everybody seems really anxious to start moving the front ensemble and mm -hmm. putting that out on the field. And that's, in my mind, that's kind of an add on to the prop discussion because now the, the front ensemble is on the moving field where all the other people are going to be doing. So you have to account for it. You got to know what, what that. Um, a little editorial on the, uh, the front ensemble change. Drill guys, visual designers, color guard people love to put the pit on the field. Mm -hmm. As a rule, percussion and band directors hate the pit on the field. <laughs> so, as you go into negotiations on your design meetings, know that going in. Uh, the pit guy is going to say, nope, I want him on the front sideline. So, um, <laughs> you know, some of that is developing rapport with the rest of your design team. And some of it is just knowing what the program is ready for. You know, if, if a program has never had moving props, I wouldn't suggest doing moving props, putting the pit out on the 50 yard line and doing all these other things at the same time. You gotta, you know, I guess take your time in expanding a program's development, what they're, what you're asking them to do every year. You know, don't pile too much on if they're not ready for all those steps. Great. So yes, all of that. Um, all of it. Yeah. Um, all right. So, a lot of questions before, so this is gonna be great. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you want to click in with any of those, you can. Um, otherwise, let's see. Uh, should I download these these screenshots that we uploaded here, Dustin? Is that gonna no, be that's for everybody else. So these okay. are the screenshots that Jamie's going to be showing throughout uh, the session here, just so that y'all have them. And if you'd share uh, your screen, you can start sh uh, showing those. <clears throat> yeah, I, so should I pull those up as PDFs on my screen, Dustin? Is that my best yes, option? Yes, mm -hmm. Okay, hold on a second. Let me get those pulled up over here, my documents. If you just let us know where we're starting, and if someone wants to pull it up on their screen, they can do the same. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so the first thing I was going to do, um, I put up a bunch of things called uh, Lindsay Random Props. Um, do you want to open those up, Dustin, or do I open, the, open those up here? That, yes, sir, and then just share your screen. Gotcha. And sharing my screen. not sharing, Dustin. Hmm. I'm clicking on the icon. It says. And then click share screen. And then oh, choose yeah. your entire screen and choose the correct window. OK, and let me get the correct image over there. I had it on my wrong screen. Perfect. Um, I should share my other main screen. Sorry, Sorry for my technological uh, <laughs> difficulties here, everybody. Okay. okay, drag this over here. There we go. Okay, so um, something that I do when I'm going to design a show is yeah, I go I to share the screen. It's not sharing yet. Oh, sorry about that, Dustin. Mm -hmm. Share. On the uh, session window, just click on the sharing yep. options at the bottom. There we go. All okay. right. We got it now. Okay, um, so something that I do, I, I do a bunch of shows with Lindsay Vento. We're friends, and we, we work together a bunch. And something we started doing a few years ago, um, we just do a bunch of random prop setups. Once we kind of get into a show and we talk about what might work for them, mm -hmm. um, you know, she, w her and I will kind of brainstorm, okay, they're ready for moving props. Let's do 10 big things or eight little things or 24 small things or some handheld things. Um, this, is, this is a presentation. Lindsay just did a presentation the other day. Um, 
and she asked me to just kind of make her some general ones, kind of demonstrating some stuff that we would do in the past. Um, and, and so I just made some general layouts for her. Um, sorry about that. Um, and these were, um, these are really just general. These didn't pertain to any one show. She said, hey, just write me some things with some small uh, three foot circles. Mm -hmm. What are all some different settings that we can do with some, some circles? And so I made a, made a bunch of these things and I need to drag them over here. So we just did different setups showing some different ways that, um, that we could utilize those same props. I moved them around the field for her. She did this in a presentation to band directors showing um, how you can do some different stuff. And, and my goal was just to give her some, some jumping out points. And this is what her and I would do in private mm -hmm. before we ever showed this to the rest of the design team. And, and we just come up with all the different options of ways that you could use this prop. And right. this one we just different setups. Um, we then kick the tires on which ones she likes, which ones I like. Once she finds the setup and I kind of say, you know, we'll kind of go back and forth and say, okay, I think in this show, they probably shouldn't move things more than three times. That's probably going to be a good amount for them to bite off. Or they're really good. They're used to logistics. They've used prop to bunch. We can do eight setups six sets because they're hands up, whatever the number is we decide on. Then her and I will go and we'll kind of look at the different, um, we'll look at the different layouts mm -hmm. and she'll be like, okay, I like this layout. Here's some more things. And, and with these layouts, she kind of picks the ones that she's like, I can build an effect around that setup. Okay. We'll put the guard on the diagonal, we'll put the winds all over here. That's cool. She's like, that's cool. We can, whether or not she knows where it's going to go in the show, She's like, that's something we can do with. I'm like, okay. And again, I just made general prop setups that I thought this looks like a useful prop setup that we could do. So even before you start putting people on the field, you're just yep. getting general ideas of one, we've established that we want some moving props. Let's try to get some ideas on the field for those. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is well before any, this is usually what with, with, with Lindsay. And now I do this with a bunch of my different program coordinator clients. Um, mm -hmm. We did this way before, like most of my bands for the fall, we've already done this process before the music's even done. Cause it really helps the program coordinators know like, okay, there's in addition to the music I'm working on stuff like that, there's gonna be four prop setups. And, and this kind of helps them program their stuff. Um, I didn't used to do this five years ago. I didn't do this for anybody. Now I do this or I offer it to everybody and probably half to two thirds of my groups ask for this. And starting in February or March, when we start talking music, we start doing these things and laying them out. Um, and so once, you know, once we find them and, and we're like, oh, that's a cool one, that's a cool one, that's a cool one. And, you know, let's say we came up with six that we liked. I now go back and try to pick them in what I think is going to be the best order. Um, and, and part of that is just the, and that's not a creative choice. That's a functional choice that I'm making. And, and, that, and that is through my experience of knowing that you don't want a prop to have to sprint all the way across the field, right? right? It's just logistics. So, right. So then after we find all of that stuff, then we'll go and I'll, I'll tell her, like, I think this is going to be the best order for the props, mm -hmm. just based on what you want to start in, where you want to go so that they're not traveling really far one way on the field and then having to go 30 yards the other way. Only be, not because that's a bad thing, but because logistically, I know that most people look really bad moving a prop for 40 yards. So try right. not to do that. So I'll try to come up with an order of the pictures that she thinks we can use effectively. And I'll say, well, this one's a great starting point because this one's a great ending point and they lead from here to here to here to here. Um, I pulled up on my screen share here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Academy thing from 2019. Okay. And we did one of these, Lindsay and I did. And we, we went back and forth first on initial layout where the front ensemble is going to be blah, blah, blah. And then we said, okay, we're going to have some of the moving props. We're going to have this things be stationary. The front ensemble is going to be stationary. These things are all going to move. We had laid them out. I found an order that I thought worked best. And then I put them here so she could kind of look at it and be like, oh, okay. We wound up inserting a couple other setups, which happens often. Right. But this gave her a good layout. So she had this in hand as she was working with the music arrangers. And she was kind of plotting out how far between events things were she knew what kind of the fence post setups we were going to do. And again, this is way before any drill was done. We have this for a reference and she says, Hey, in the ballad, let's go to prop setup six. That's going to be the ballad set. And she puts that in her notes. So I have all the other details and over in the line says prop setup six at measure 13. Awesome. We already know what that setup is. We probably have a pretty good idea of how long it takes to get there and stuff like that. 
Right. Um, so that's, yeah, go ahead. We have a question from James. Do you ever find yeah. yourself needing to adjust the order of prop setups based on the musical flow? Yes. Um, not typically the order, um, but we will sometimes insert additional setups to help get to something. I see. Um, typically the order is kind of picked because it was a good order and the events were gonna fit within that order. We will change, I mean, if I, I would say when we're conceptualizing, we might wholly reorder like, hey, let's take the grid and swap spots with the circle in the show. Hmm. Once we've kind of started the process, we typically wouldn't change that too much though. Um, we, we might though say like, it's a long haul to get from the grid to the circle. So let's have a scatter in between, inserting something in between. So again, you're trying to eliminate some of these really long moves that you have to do. Right. Um, I have another thing here that I'll show you that I've done. Um, again, this is just for props. Um, I think, let's look at, I think it was North Harden we did this one on. Uh, North Harden is a great little band if you guys haven't seen them. Their show last year, I loved it. It was a great, great show. Um, okay, it was not this one. I opened the wrong file. I'm failing. Um, no, I'm just trying to show you on one of these shows that, um, I sometimes put on there for Lindsay how long it's going to take to get from one prop setup to the next so that she has a concrete idea like, okay, this is a 28 count maneuver. Um, which one did I do that on? Let's try Mr. Ridge. I think I have Mr. Ridge in here. Okay, yeah. So once we figured out our field setups here on some of these layouts, mm -hmm. I put in addition to what the setup is. So this is this was the first setup of that show. This was the second setup of that show. Okay. In addition, I put a marker for the prop that I recognized had to go the furthest of the group. So on side one, the prop that goes the furthest needs about 32 counts to get from here to its new location here. Side two, I did the same thing so, so that I knew the furthest prop over here was going to need about 32 counts to go from here to here. Um, I did that in a, a few of the different moves so that, again, she could know, like, I'm building in a transition here. This is part of the construction of the music. After the hit, we're going to start a development. In the development, the props need to move. She can look at this and be like, oh, I need at least 32 counts if everything's moving at once. If we're going to layer the prop movement, 32 is the minimum, 16 props, add four counts for each prop if we're sequentialing it. But this helps kind of functionally build the framework of your show. Uh, right. it, it really helps you so you're not guessing or get into the close. You're like, oh, my God, I can't get the props where I wanted them, or it's going to take me 150 counts to get there. Um, so these are some logistic things that, that uh, we've kind of discovered over the years that help us framework a show. Um, in, in reference to James's question, the form I have pulled up here, we didn't actually use this form. Once we got into the show and we got to the closer, we because that's not the form we wanted. It wound up being a big old A-frame shape. So we just picked a whole different setup to end that show with. Great. Ah. Um, yeah, so those are kind of some of my pre-design chunked out stuff that we do. And, and for all you guys that are writing shows, you know, you might not know some of the pitfalls of the problems you're going to have with moving props, but if you could adopt a system like this, where you at least get a ballpark of what the setups are going to be throughout the show, it'll save you so much headache. Um, you know, I always think drill writing is, is, you know, it's solving a matrix of equations, you know, and sometimes it gets to be 30 equations you're trying to solve at the same time. Any of those you could take off your plate is certainly going to help you, you know, solve the problem easier. You know, if the props off the plate, I know the props are moving at measure at letter A to B. That's the prop move. I don't have to concern myself with that. I'm just managing bodies otherwise. Um, so it's, it's really helped me a lot, um, even knowing that it's probably going to change. <laughs> Great. Ah. That's awesome. Now, when you're starting this, you normally just have the general idea of the show, correct? Yes. Before and music is either not written or hasn't really been chosen. So it's just kind of, you, you start this and then start everything else. I think that's generally most of the shows I work on now, but I mean, that's not all shows. I, you know, some of that Dustin comes down to program coordinators and what people, what people like, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think more, I, I, I guess I reference BOA shows because those are the ones that I kind of spend the most of my time working on. And, right. you know, these are big, huge bands with lots of people and lots of stuff moving around. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's just trying to, I guess, what the program coordinators are, are, are de building the show out of, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like most of the designers I work with start with a concept 
and the right. concept is something that has a visual hook and a music hook and and you kind of simultaneously design those along the way um you kind of once you get the the concept you get a visual like the thing we did here where it's really just big bullet point the big fence post kind of things in the show then the music goes and gets written and then when it comes back to me it's like okay the music has been written and i know where these fence posts are going to fit within that show right so i guess it's mostly concept but occasionally somebody's like you know i want i love this piece of music and we're doing this piece of music and that, that's cool then you know then, then you write a show around that um but typically I think most of the shows that i wind up working on are start from the concept out right uh, we have a question from Chris. Uh, have you had any, ex any experience uh, having to add props to a box show where the band director wants multiple prop moments, but the music wasn't written for it? No. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, but the, only that's because I, I don't do a lot of box shows. Most of the shows I work on now are custom shows. Um, but I think that question can be answered with, um, I think that, you know, part of, Part of being a drill writer is is helping band directors and program coordinators navigate the logistics of a show. Right. Um, mo most people, even really really good band directors, don't always have a good grasp on the logistics of what it takes to do something. Um, you know, you can't tell you how many times you know you get ideas and they're like, "Want everybody in a tight ball on the twenty, and then like eight counts later, it's like spread out full grid on the field." You know, <laughs> like, the laws of physics dictate that I can't do that. Right. Um, and, and I think part of that is having that conversation and being able to, you know, to be able to parse that without, I guess, being offensive or, you know, and there's the art to that, you know, how you communicate. Um, and band just don't know that. And I found often that if you could just explain it free of, you know, free of emotion and just logistically say, there's not time to do that. Or you say, okay, that's great. We can move stuff. We're going to need 24 bodies in order to move this stuff. Which 24 bodies do you want me to use? Right. And they're like, oh, well, you can't. Everybody's playing. Well, they can't move the props. You know, it's mainly just explaining the logistics of this. Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of a lot of all that we do is so much more functional and just pragmatic problem solving than creative. You know, we think we, we go, you know, you go to BOA finals and DCI finals, and it's this overwhelming creativity that hits you in the face. But it's it's really like a very small group of people that are being creative, and most everybody else is being an engineer. You know, the drill writer, you're the general contractor on the job. You know, hopefully you're not designing the house color and where the bedrooms are going and everything else. Sometimes you have to because they don't have a program coordinator. They don't know and that's your gig. Right. But ideally, they're telling you, I want a craftsman style house. I want three bedrooms. I want two baths. And then your job is to construct it with the best mechanics you can. So it really comes down to being a lot more functional than creative. And that goes for props. I mean, you, you, your prop choices should be functionally achievable more than an artistic choice. Right. You know, um, uh, I think the people that get to make artistic choices are pretty far and few between, you know, most of the rest of us got to plug and chug. Understood. Uh, we have a question from Jason. Uh, he's writing for with props for the first time this upcoming season. What mm -hmm. advice can you give to ensure success? How do you make sure to utilize the props and stages in a balanced way? Yeah. Right. Not too much, not too little. How do yep. we find that sweet spot? First question would be, have they moved props before? If the answer is no, then I would move them at the least possible or the least number of things moving. So maybe you start and you have some stationary props and two moving things or three moving things. Um, you know, another another thing to do is I would always err on the side of caution. I say that having been like, I can't, I'd spent decades being like, they got that. They can do that. They can do that. You can do that with two bodies. How do you make that? And it just doesn't. It's just you overtax people. Um, you overtax kids, you know, you ask them to already play and do all these other things. And now you've got eight counts to move a prop 10 yards and get your horn back on your face and enter again. Um, so I would say err on the, on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to try moving things, figure out the least number of moving things you can do to pull off the idea. And moving the least amount possible is always better. I mean, um, often create effect if you're going to have a grid of props. You can create an effect by just taking every prop off of its dot by two steps and turning it at an angle. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your starting set. And then when you want to sense a resolution, everything only has to move a little bit and line up. And now you basically moved every prop two steps and changed the angle of it, but you created a resolution and you didn't have to move anything 10 yards. Right. Um, just, I, I guess the overriding message is don't underestimate how much it taxes kids to do this stuff. Right. Um, 
when planning things like this, you're yeah. uh, wanting to know, uh, or how do you get the information on how the props or how heavy the props are? So how you can gauge the right. number of performers and things like that. How do you manage that? Because a lot of times, since it's a concept, you know, we, we may plan to build it out of uh, aluminum, but we can only build it out of plywood or something. So that that changes the weight tremendously. Absolutely. No, that, and that is a very vital questions. Um, and, you know, I think part of that is is ask a lot of questions, find out as many answers as you can. Um, and then you got to like along the way you have to adjust. Um, I pulled up something here for us to look at. This is Vista Ridge from Austin last year. Um, I say this because this show had lots of accommodations mid process. Um, we built these moving props back here, these arc of moving props. These were really cool. Kids could climb up on top of them, spin a flag and stuff. Then we actually, this giant rotating prop, this was the Mandarin's prop um, from a couple summers ago. They bought and added this in late in the process. Oh, wow. And it drastically changed what we did because it's a three foot high shield blocking the entire middle of the field. Mm -hmm. So we had to accommodate ideas throughout as it went. You know, you had to, things that we thought were going to work didn't wind up working. Um, let me open up another show here. I'm giving you a long-winded answer to that question because I think it's a really good question. Um, you know, another show that last, just last year that we had to do that was kind of exactly what you're talking about was the, um, the LD Bell show. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that. They had, um, they had a bunch of individually moving props. Okay. Um, and they were flat on the ground. It was basically a seven and a half by seven and a half foot tarps with on a little wooden frame that laid on the ground. And when you picked them up, two people picked them up and they turned into sandwich boards and you can move them and then lay them flat out again. Now, when we started this show, we had no idea what that looked like. They, and you guys are gonna have a lot of bands that do this where they didn't have them built in the summertime. At the beginning of band camp, we didn't know exactly how these were gonna work, which was a problem for the drill writer. Right. Uh, uh, so you, you really just have to stay lots of communi in communication constantly and we kind of, so in this show, we didn't move them for the, for the first minute and a half because it was like, okay, we need to get them built in person. They started, once they had a prototype, they started sending me quick little videos. We think we can do it two people. It's not a four person job. It's a two person job. We have on you. But it, we found this information out after August 1st. So in this show, when, when we started this show, um, the, in the opener, they didn't move at all. So the whole, the whole opener just, they sat there because I wasn't sure, again, what your question, how many people was it gonna take? How was it gonna move? Right. So we started with all of them laying on the ground in a grid. I didn't know, so we wrote the entire first production without them moving at all. And that was the first thing, because I said, well, that'll get, it's gonna take you a few weeks to learn that. And right. in that process, you're gonna have built some, and then we can decide what, what it's gonna be. But we didn't know going in. So I couldn't do one of those like layouts that we did like I showed you that I do with some of Lindsay shows because exactly. we didn't know what the prop was going to look like and how it was going to maneuver. So we couldn't do those setups ahead of time. So that had to happen while the show was being developed. So sometimes that's how it works and you got to go along with it. And um, you know, from your own experiences, you learn how to cope with things as they come up like that. Understood. Good question. We have a question from Dan. Uh, what's the most effective way to use stationary props to frame smaller bands? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I generally kind of think 20 to 20 back hash if it's, you know, 100, 120 bodies or whatever, and then start bringing it in more if it's smaller, bigger if it's if it's not. Um, and I think it, it kind of be creative where, you know, you don't have to frame the whole thing out, but you can, you know, um, trying to think if I have uh, something I can show you here. I didn't plan on showing this one, but I have, let's, let's look at Union City you did last year. They're a cool little band okay. um, and they don't have many people. We wanted to kind of shrink this one down, but didn't want to close it in quite as much as we typically do. Uh -huh. um, but you can see here, we kind of made a frame. We made a, a frame of flats that kind of eliminated anything outside the 20 here. And then in my head, I kind of said, and we're not going to really go outside the 20 here. Uh -huh. So this still feels really big. Right. But you see, we're not really going outside the 20s, and we've kind of made the back hash kind of a, a checkpoint for us there. Um, even throughout this show, as props moved, we didn't occupy a lot of space. But I generally say try to keep it between the 20s as much as possible. Um, 
you know, any any way you can do that. It can be flats on uh, vertical flats that you just rearrange. It can be tarps dragged out. Uh, tarps have their own hurdles as far as logistic difficulties and things like that. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think anything you can do to limit the field is, is great for small bands. And, you know, with any band nowadays, everybody's bringing stuff out. If you don't bring any stuff out, it, you kind of feel small. Right. So you almost need to bring stuff just so you feel like you have a value out there. Um, <laughs> You know, you see, you see with some drum cores and you feel bad because some drum cores bring out, you know, a, a four truckloads of stuff and it looks like they have 250 bodies, but you know, they have 150 and then somebody doesn't use props and they just look so, so small by comparison. Right. Understood. Um, the Blue Spring show from 18 was a show that we used tarps to define space. Mm -hmm. uh, i trying to think where I put this. Pardon my uh, stumbling about here. Um, We did uh, that that show. That show we did to um, we, we put the tarps out to define space and never really moved them, mm -hmm. with the goal of oh my god, we've moved everything for so long that we got to stop moving stuff. Uh, <laughs> I know it was. Uh, I totally can't find this now. I totally ha I I put it on here and I can't see where I put it. But um, there's images in the uh, there's images in the the zip file that, that Dustin uploaded. Okay. There's a bunch of Blue Springs images that have that that field laid out on there. Sorry, I just uploaded to 10, so all those files are on my other computer that's still version 9. Um, I thought I transferred them over, but I can't find them. I don't know what I did with them. Well, let's um, but the tar I can I can take over what can you can walk through yeah. those. You might have stopped sharing here. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, but I, th I think I uh, think using non-moving props to define space is a really good way for small bands, so you don't have to move stuff around. Yeah. Uh, so that so that show, it, which obviously this is a big band and grandiose, but this was these tarps were because we were just tired of Blue Springs to spend many years like moving tons of junk around the field, and we we're and we were like we've got to have a season where we don't move stuff around, but we still wanted to have the, the grandiose feel of everything. So we had placed these out and then never moved them. It wound up being just as logistically tough as any, any other show we did because when you pull this much tarp out, it's a whole other challenge. Right. Um, something to – can I change topics here, Dustin? Yeah. Let's jump on a different topic here while you have that up on the screen. Sure. So something I do, and you guys as the drill writers – I assume you're drill writers who listen to this um, – interject math where you can. <laughs> I always say to the Blue Devil members, if you're not good at math, get good at math. Um, marching is a lot of geometry on the field. When you place your props, it should not be arbitrary. Um, these tarps are not arbitrary. We went back and forth on the angles of these things. I sent Lindsay a ton of images to see what she liked. I didn't tell her that every one of the images, I placed the props at a formula that's going to help us later. Um, and this is whether we're doing box props or tarps or anything else like that. Um, so. I know that I'm going to want to write drill sets that are two by two, 45 degree angles. We're going to have lots of drill sets where you might be back four over two, back four over two, back four, over, that kind of grid. These right. are, these are formulas that you naturally use. I naturally use them. I don't know if you do. These are things that I use. So I looked at the props at a lot of those. So like this prop right here, this, this long with all the bodies on, that's yeah. back two over one is the formula. If there were, if you were on practice field, this goes through a gap every yard line. Oh, great. You don't know that when you watch, but the members know that. This, these two props, this one over here and this prop here, these are on 45s. So when you're on a, any, any filled form next to those is going to fill in nicely along the edges of those things. Um, now, when you look at it creatively, and again, this is where we made functional decisions, but collectively, that looks like a really creative choice, doesn't it? You right. look at it like, wow, man, that's cool. They just... That show is called From a Different Angle. They just ran and put all those props out there at different angles. It's like, well, those are functional angles that are really going to help us with our process that we need to do. So, and it covered up the helmet accidentally. Um, well, accidentally on purpose. Well, when you're planning with these props, we have a question from Brad. Should you usually show which student is moving which prop within the transition in the software? Do you do that? Do you? Yes. Do you, yes, you do. Um, and well, yes. I honestly, yes. Always and always, yes on that. Um, Unless the band is really good and they're going to take care of it, um, but but what I I think you have to account for it, and much like the question earlier about you know how do you account for it, how heavy it takes and how many people it takes, right. I try to overshoot overestimate on that as well. If you think two people can move it, 
put three there. Um, if if they have one alternate per prop, which is great, like Vista Ridge that we just had pulled up, they had enough alternates to have one alternate at each prop, and that alternate was the owner of the prop. They had mm -hmm. to get it out of the rehearsal and get it back in, and, and they had a little list on there of the coordinates and everything. Right. But every time they moved it, another band kid came to assist them because we discovered that two bodies were better than one for moving those little things. Right. But I assigned the kid each time. Um, you know, the ultimate thing you're trying to do when you're constructing a show is get rid of errors, you know, right. get rid of uglies. And anytime you don't, as the draw writer, if you don't plan it out, somebody that's less organized than you is going to plan it out. Somebody that doesn't have as keen of eye for visual layout is going to do it. And they're probably going to pick the weakest player. And Murphy's Law states that person is nowhere near their, the prop that they want to move. Right. And they're probably going to do some ugly ass transition to have somebody sprint <laughs> to get to a prop, move it, and then sprint back. So yes, I do the plan. Same thing with solos and anybody that comes or goes from the drill, I take that on me to, to make it the prettiest, absolute gl most glorious thing. Um, goes for color guard transitions too. If, if it's a band that I don't know the color guard instructor very well, I'll take the time to do two counts to the front layer transition. You have three counts to pick up and you flag and go. Mm -hmm. If it's a friend of mine and we have rapport, the notes will say transition to the front, get new equipment and in a blob. Mm -hmm. That's the rapport once you kind of know people and how, how far you want to do that. But with, with props, I, I would certainly do that. Understood. Um, we have a question from Brantley. With uh, your plan out uh, drill files that you make with your props, how do you get those transferred over to the actual drill? Um, sometimes I'll use the file. Most often I just start a new file. Well, usually I just start a new file. Um, you know, it's funny. I think, um, I think when, when we're all starting to use Pyware, you know, the learning curve is a little steep and you, and, and you, there's moments of frustration. Don't tell Dustin, but there's, there's many moments of frustration and we sometimes get in the habit of trying to save things and save that and try to recycle that and save it. Really at the end of the day, often just start over and do it just do all the work. You get faster at it. You get better at it the more you do it. So I just, I know, I know what the prop sizes are with the performer prop tool, the new one, it doesn't take that long to make 24 new scaffolding props, put right. 24 dots in there, highlight all of them, put this, put the, you know, the dimensions of the prop, boom, you're done. So I generally won't transfer them. I'll leave it as a separate file so I can reference back to it when Lindsay's like, go to page six. I can go and look at it. Okay. I know what that was. Sometimes I do delete them because I just transferred over and start writing the drill. Right. And then later on, she's like, you six. I'm like, oh, man, I deleted that file. Can you send me what page six was? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, you can see on this chart, too, I started adding uh, with the, the chart that Dustin has up there. I started putting flow mics up front and drum majors and speakers and all that stuff because it runs into problems. You don't put it in there and then you go to you go to your first BOA regional and your drum major podium is exactly on top of the flow mic. So this happened to me at regionals and you try to move it and the flow people are yelling at you and your drum majors looking at you and it's a little panic modes. So I try to put as many random items that wind up on the front sideline in there as I can. Understood. Great. Another funny thing, I, I start babbling now. Um, I didn't used to use as many of the options that you guys have, Dustin, as far as like the pretty props and, and the flag spinning and kneeling right. and lunges. I have found that when I put that stuff in, people think my drill is better. <laughs> like I can send the exact same drill. It doesn't matter. You go back, you spend 15 minutes, you make all the flags go around, you toss on the halts and you send it back out and they're like, oh, that's great. That's so much better. I just made the flags go around. Yeah, I'm not the one writing the flag words, but if you feel better about it, it's worth my time, I guess. Exactly. Awesome. Well, we've got a, a question from Julian. When using stationary props to frame a small band, do you end up repeating ideas uh, to reference the props? If not, how to, how, do you have any tips on avoiding repetition? Yes, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think anytime, anytime you're designing a show, you know, repetition is a, is a major issue. Um, I had the pleasure and or pain, as you want to describe it, of, of developing my career on the West Coast. Um, the Whitcombs, Shirley and Kathy and George O, they run the circuit out here in California, WBA, Western Band Association. They're amazing judges. Have they, I mean, they, they all wrote all the sheets for WGI and DCI, and they're great judges. And George was my partner math teacher at James Logan, and I knew the Whitcombs. And they took it upon themselves to really tell me constantly what I was doing wrong. 
Um, and what it did for me is A, made me thick skinned, but B, I, I developed some things like to answer Julian's question, I used to have sticky notes around my screens and I'd have like variety and I would have like uh, not too many blocks. Uh, do you scatter? And I, you know, I would just these, these key notes that I would hear in the fall, you know, Kathy used to be like, you have too many blocks in your show. Okay, so I write a little note like no, no blocks, put it on stick. And it's just about finding the variety. And again, that comes down to a functional thing more than a creative thing. I mean, you're being creative in the moment, but you know, when I go to write another phrase, if I'm writing the next phrase of a, of a chart, I'll always go back and look at everything I've done before then, including from the top of the show. Give it a quick glance and I kind of make some mental notes. Okay, I, I, I've been pretty tight for a long time. Been tight for a long time. We need to get big. Um, we've been linear for a long time. We need to get curvilinear. And it's really just variety, just like anything else in our life. You got to have variety. If you watch an entire show of blocks, um, you know, it feels like Texas Band 1983. Um, but, you know, it's just like you just can't in modern band. You got to have variety in your form choices. Right. Um, you know, part of that, going back to the your the functional decisions you make, um, when I look at a score, you know, and I make my count sheets. I'll hold up one of them. Of one of my ugly count sheets. Is. This is a count sheet I was working on. It's an LD Bell count sheets so what I was working on earlier. So um, when I make these count sheets, um, you know, I, I I I write, I look at where people are and aren't playing, and, and when I have spaces to move people, and it, and if I look, it's like okay, I can't be tight the whole time. Band directors are going to ask you to have everybody as close together as you can all the time on the fifty yard line. That's their choice. You got to know that going in, right? Um, if it, drum guys, they want the drum line centered all the time behind. So knowing these things, you have to then say, okay, well, the creative part of me and the visual judges and the visual community is going to ask that I do other things besides being a tight form on the 50 the whole show. So look for spots in your show where you can be other things. What are the forms that nobody wants to play in? Giant grid covering the field. Nobody wants to play in it, but it's a great form. So look at your outline. When do you have enough counts when nobody's playing when you can get in a big form? And, and again, these are just choices that, that you make because you're like, well, I can't be big when we're playing, so I'm going to be really big during drum solo and use some of those moments. So if if you know you're going to have to be really tight on the brass feature because it's really noty and the brass guy said, like, you got to be super tight. Well, then, you know, you better not use any super tight forms for 30 or 45 seconds before that because you're about to use a tight form and you don't want to feel like you've lacked variety, like you don't want to be stuck in the rut. Um, yeah, so I th that's something I, I guess that's that's kind of a, a subtlety is try to save your forms, save the band director forms for when you absolutely need them, and try to use your visual staff forms for when the, the music staff isn't going to freak out. Right. We have a question from Doug. Yes, if you uh, regularly sketch by hand in a notebook, or do you normally just sketch out in Pyware? Um, I do like drawing. I sketch. I, my office is a disaster right now. If I put my camera down, it's just my desk is covered. <laughs> um, I like drawing, so I sketch. Um, and you know what? I, 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 in particular, I sketch grids. I'm trying to I'm flipping through some things here as we're talking. Um, I sketch a lot of grids because I think it's that's the stuff that helps you organize uh, band wide. Get you know, if you're gonna have a, a, a grid with 200 bodies in it, you know, is it gonna be a square? Is it gonna be a triangle? So I'll, I'll take, I always have, I always have stacks of graph, graph paper because I like graph paper. Um, like this was, I just do a prop for a band, do that on graph paper. Um, but I'll certainly have paper available. I like drawing by hand. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I watched, I watched Mike Gaines talk that he did. And then he was saying that he's trying to go paperless. Um, I'm actually paperless on scores on all that stuff, mm -hmm. but I still like to make a handwritten count sheet because I doodle like crazy on it. So I draw stuff in the margins and I highlight things and I X things. And so I do that. And then I, I sketch big pictures. Um, I, some guys I know sketch all arrivals. Like some of the guys that I write with have notebooks and they'll be like, this is, I'm going to be in a swirl and get to here. And then I want to be in a circle. Um, I don't sketch that much, but I, when I have a form that I know is going to be hard to get to, I'll certainly sketch it. Great. Wonderful. All right. <clears throat> Well, what else do we have? Um, I can talk more. We can answer some questions. What do you think we should do, Dustin? Well, uh, we went through a couple of these. I'm just looking back through some of our examples. Mm -hmm. um, what <clears throat> What is the smallest band that you write for? 
when when we're talking small bands yeah. uh, we had a couple of weeks ago we had small bands that were 20 to 40. do you have any right. suggestions for that size uh, when you're saying small bands you were discussing right. about a hundred what, know, what right? perspective <laughs> Yeah. Let, let's look at the perspective of a small right. band. Right. Um, I would, you know, I like to treat those. I don't do a lot of those. Um, I, I only did Union City last year and they were, I think they're a 1A band. Um, but most of my bands are 6A, 5. They're just massive, these big things I do. Right. And I, I just kind of where I wind up. But I used to do a lot of smaller bands. Um, I really think, I try to treat it more like an intimate experience, like it's a WGI show. So I think okay. really close down the barriers, you know, whether you get some flats. Um, you know, I mean, if you look back even to like the Jackson Academy shows, the BOA Jackson Academy that were like, gosh, that was probably 15, 20 years ago now. They did really cool shows and they created like basically a little WGI floor with little flats. But mm -hmm. that's what's so crazy. They would all go back and get clarinets and 30 kids play clarinets and all 30 of them go back and get flags and they come back <laughs> and get all the flags. That's a little unique. But I think having the props be really close is, is cool. Um, it's different kind of writing. You know, I think... You, when you do those kinds of, you have to feel a little bit more like it's a staging, a winter guard type of experience and less drill. Um, you know, I think, I, you know, maybe look at, I feel like the center grove setup, mm -hmm. if you guys know BOA shows, they had the, the triangular props that really defined a really pretty tight area and it was all tarped and stuff. Um, it made, they filled that area, but a, a, a setup of that size worked really well for a small band. Um, I think limiting the size is good because, you know, the problem is the visual guys want to make a small band look bigger. So you put them at four step intervals right. and six step intervals and all of a sudden you, and you only got 20 kids out there and they feel like they're on an island playing. So you still want to get tight, tight stuff. So I would definitely pull it in way like you could almost write it like it was a WGI show, you know, like right. a WGI wind show, you know, and really just give yourself a, a, a tarp size space to work in. Um, and, you know, when you get those small groups, you can, I think, be more creative with the front ensemble, too. You know, if you're only using between the 35s in front of the back, in front of the front hash, mm -hmm. well, now it's, it's not that big a deal to put your front ensemble on the on the hash. You know, and they're the backstop of your working area. Right. It's a whole different listening environment. Great. Um, we have one question from Brantley. How often do you find yourself riding backwards? Aha! Yeah. Yes. <laughs> riding backwards. Um, typically, only at the top of a show, but. Sometimes I do otherwise. Um, I think that the problem is that you have to have the brain for it. And and it's, I don't even know if it's like a, an, it's not even so much an intelligence thing. It's just your brain wiring to be able to think backwards and operate the program backwards. I think the program right. works really well backwards, but you have to get your brain set up for it because it, what happens, I found a lot of people as they start writing backwards, they, they get a page in and their brain clicks to forward, but they're still going backwards and then they animate it and their stuff switches directions. And so I would typically do it on the first arrival of a show mm -hmm. if the first arrival is more important than the first page. Understood. If the first page is more important, meaning the image on the first page is more important than the arrival picture, then I would still start the first page and go forward. Okay. Often, oftentimes that doesn't matter, you know, unless your show is about snakes or something and you need to have a snake out there. Um, but yeah, what I will do sometimes um, is I'll take and I'll, if, if we're in a form here and I know that the next hit is 128 counts away, I'm like, well, it would be really cool if we were across the field in a grid down here. And I don't really know what I want to do to get there. I'll drag my page tabs for a 128 count phrase and I'll just get the thing like and mob it down there. So it's a 120 count, 128 count idea. Um, and now I won't, I'll make sure that the steps are, are smaller than eight to five so that when I go back and add a bunch of eight count subsets, I have extra room to wiggle and make it move and flip flop and flip over. And, but I like doing that because I know like, well, the arrival is really the important part right. in this case. So that's the part that I need to make sure is right. What I do on the way is just a choice. Do we rotate it? Do we flip flop it? Do we just zigzag it? Do we stack in? Those are all just functional options. But, you know, the payoff is the thing that you're going to get the most points for. So make that be the coolest part. Um, right. And I like that idea, actually, writing over many sets. I do that a lot. Not always that big a chunk, but a lot of times a 64 count idea. I write as the 64 and then I go back and start putting eight, eight, eight. Or sometimes I'll be like, I know I'm here on 64, on 32, I kind of have to be halfway there. 
in some other form. And now I only have 32 counts left to kind of finish the idea. Got it. Um, Shannon asks, what is your process for charting out theatrical moments? Uh, uh, flutter, mo or flutter movement and et cetera, especially for first time groups. Yes, 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 yes. Um, this comes to staffing and, you know, this happens a lot, especially to drill writers, is, you know, you have bands probably less successful than some other groups that are like, we want to have less sets. We want to do a show like band XYZ did. And they only had 60 sets and they had this giant organic moment in the show. And as a drill writer, you say, okay, who do you have that's going to produce that? If they don't have a person that can produce that moment, then you can't do that moment. Now, as the drill writer, you, you might have those skills, which is awesome if you do. And if that's a school that you go to, then you should do it and that should be part of your plan. If you don't go and they don't have somebody that can do that, don't do those moments. Um, but I, I certainly encourage all of my bands to get some personnel that can do that, whether it's somebody in your marching staff or on your color guard staff or somebody like a Michael Rosales that you hire that just comes in and slams in a bunch of body on the weekend. Whatever your thing is, band directors aren't going to know how to do that. Um, a lot of color guard instructors might not be timely enough to do it. They might, you know, they might have the skills, but don't know how to talk to knucklehead trombone players and get them to do a simple thing really fast. So finding the personnel to produce those moments is really the key thing. Um, you know, for me, I, I try to write fence post setups for that kind of thing. Like, okay, I know we're going to start in a block. It's going to layer out. I might just do the layer out and then bleh, it ends over here. And I'll say, okay, you've got 64 counts. It should feel like it's traveling. You should feel like you arrive sequentially and the last guy gets in on the last count. That would be something I would say to a school where I know they have somebody producing it or I know the personnel there. Was that, was that a good answer to that question? Perfect. Um, we have a question from Justin Mons. What math formulas do you feel every drill writer should master? <laughs> Mr. Architect over here. <laughs> Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. I know. That, thanks, Justin, for making me look hypocritical on that. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know math formulas. Um, no, I say that. Like, I have a degree in math and I was a math teacher. I, I think I'm really naturally good at math, but I don't necessarily think about the formulas. Um, I think Pywer has a lot of really useful formulas for you. You know, I never used to use the measuring tool, and I use the right. measuring tool like crazy now. Um, and I use the measuring tool to figure out how far a person needs to go. Um, some other things I just know, like I know that if somebody traveling on a diagonal over eight down four, I know that's seven two seven point two to five. I know that because power tells me that every time I put it in. Now I right. could write a formula and figure it out. Nah. I know, you know, a different diagonal is six point four to five. You know, going down a, a you know, four by four diagonal. You know, these are things you learn from power, and then you learn, okay, high school students aren't gonna look good doing five to five. They'll look good doing eight to five. So let's do that. Um, yeah. Sorry, Justin, I didn't have any formulas ready. For I'll say Pythagorean theorem just so you feel better about it. Boom. <clears throat> uh, Ivan asks, can you walk us through your design process when designing in person on the spot? Yes. When, say, you group, uh, your group flies you to redesign the session or a set or yeah. closer. How do, you, how do you manage that? <clears throat> yep. Um, these organic processes, you know, um, I do a lot of WGI. I do, I do Riverside, I do RCC and United Percussion in, in, the, in the winter. And they're both world percussion groups that we spend a lot of time doing this. This is pretty much everything we write is in person, on the spot, doing it. Blue Devils, we write tons of things on the spot, in person. The process should be that you have goals and accommodations along the way. Um, I, feel, I think sometimes people see these, these things happening where you see like, oh, that guy's out there and he's just making this up off the top of his head. You know, there, there was a plan going in beforehand. Like it was, okay, I know that I want to get to a tight thing in the middle of the field. That's my destination. That's, a plan. That, that's at least a destination. I know that I can either do groups arriving every two, every four, every eight, every 12, depending on the music, because I listen to music a bunch of times and I thought, okay, these are arrival points. So I have lots of parts broken down before I do the organicness of it. Um, I don't think you can go and just kind of open it and be like, let's see where inspiration strikes. Um, you know, drum corps, you can do that occasionally, but typically it's people's time is more valuable than you brainstorming in front of them. So, you know, I will have ideas, you know, and I'll know like, okay, there's, we can layer in here 
And if I say, well, let's give you two counts or four counts in spot before you leave, now you just have to fill in a body thing. I'll, I'll do the arranging of the bodies and stuff and be like, four count visual, then you leave. You leave two counts later, two counts later, two counts later, two counts. And, and I know that the destination is over here. Somebody else will come write the body, your body guy or your guard instructor, whoever does that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a plan and I knew where I wanted to go. And I kind of thought, well, if the kids are really good, we'll layer this every two counts. Okay. If it feels like they're kind of struggling, let's do four people leaving every four counts. If that still feels like a lot, okay, you eight kids do this all together. And now you leave together. Now you eight kids do this. And if that's still a struggle, let's do an ensemble thing. Everybody, let's all together. Let's go do this visual. And now we all move and flutter run together. Um, so I think having those parameters knowing that you have the ultimate goal. This is, I'm going to do it in four counts, two counts is my, these, I have a checkpoint every two counts. Then you get there like, okay, they're not good enough for that. Let me dumb down the idea or simplify the idea. Um, I think having those bailouts, you have to have those bailouts ready or else you get in those situations when, you know, kids and staff are looking at you like, sorry, my idea didn't work. <laughs> uh, experience helps a ton on that. Honestly, just doing it a bunch and realizing, okay, that didn't work stop that idea but um have it, having having some bailout plans the main plan bailout one bailout two bailout three great um how often do you or just for an example how often do you fly out to your groups is it about half of your groups that you do that or um I, it changes from year to year the last few years i've kind of been on a cycle uh last year i went to ld bell three times Blue Springs four times, I think, and Vista Ridge two, two or three times. And those are the only bands I went to um, just because I spend most of my time at my house. I know some people go more. Sometimes I go to, I have two Houston bands. Most years I go there and check those bands last, last year got a little weird. Uh, right. I had scheduled before everything blew up. I had three trips to, to Austin, three trips to Dallas, four trips to Missouri. I had planned so far in my schedule. Um, yeah. So, but again, this goes different people, you know, there was a time when I went to a lot of bands often and I went a lot. Um, it just got to be where, I mean, I, I have a, a, the shows I have to be home more to keep up with my end of the writing the product. Um, you know, I think I teach drill pretty well, but there's probably more people that teach well than there are people that write well. And so I kind of, well, I'm going to slide a little bit more into the writing, let the other people do a little more of the teaching. I still like to teach some because I feel like you have to have a connection to members. You know, I, Right. I, I have one group every, at least one group each season that I go to often because I like seeing kids and interacting with kids and all of that stuff. I think the guys are just right in their house all the time. You kind of lose a little bit of that connection with what it's like to be a 16 year old and sweat through all this stuff sometimes. That gives you a perspective when you're writing, right? <clears throat> right. Absolutely. Right. I had said, I remember years ago, I had said like, I'm always going to teach full time. And then, you know, you get to a point where you're like, I make a lot more money if I design four more shows. <laughs> Understood. Well, does anybody else have any questions for Jamie today? We're getting towards the end of our session tonight. And Jamie, thank you so much for coming on. Yes, absolutely. It was fun. That's wonderful. A lot yeah, of insight. Uh, we have a question from Shant. Uh, in your Pyware examples, how are you incorporating the color coding of the drill page tabs? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, let me open something that it has here. And you'll just have to start that screen share once more. Yeah, definitely. Let me uh, let me open something here. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I didn't used to do this, and I started doing it, and I love it now. Um, we go to the 2019 shows. Let's pull up something. Let's see what this looks like. It's gonna, ah, okay, there we go. Okay, share, share screen. Okay, am I up there, Dustin? Uh, looks like it. Okay. Um, okay, so I think Sean's talking about this bottom line here, the colors yes. down here. The H tab yeah. color. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I, okay, so I have my own formulas that I use. Some of them randomly change, but some of them are. So for me, green is percussion. Okay. Light green is typically like a front ensemble entrance. Um, a, a light color like the yellow or the light blue would probably be a soloist. I don't remember on this particular show, but it was probably a baritone soloist followed by a saxophone soloist. Pink are usually woodwind features. Darker would be a lower woodwind section for me. Uh, a lighter pink would be 
a different woodwind section being featured. Uh, blue is all skate. Red is halt. Red is halt. Reshape, halt again, feature out. Um, I started doing that, I, and I do that right when I put all the stuff in. Th Dustin, this goes back into the, I didn't used to use all the PyWare features, and as I insert more PyWare features, it gets better. Right. Um, I started doing that because it really helps me. Now when I look at this, if assuming I've only written two sets, right. I can look at this bottom tab and know like the chunks. You know, so when I was saying earlier, sometimes I write over like a five or six or eight page chunk. I can look and be like, oh, it's basically the same instruments that are playing for all of this. So like this stuff right here, I could, this is all just woodwinds, th this whole chunk here. So, you know, it doesn't matter what the subsets were other than it's woodwinds are playing. You know, that's helpful information to me to know that it's similar instrument groupings down there. Um, yeah, so I started, I, I, a lot of my scores I went up doing that, or my count sheets, I went up doing that too. Um, once I, my, my ones I write out by hand, I have a whole set of highlighters and I'll just quickly do percussion green, woodwinds pink, brass, a color blue, all skate, reds. And it just helps you look and be like, block it out in your brain. You know, okay, right. I'm here, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. Um, no. I also like to color code my, my people on the field. Um, right. I do percussion uh, percussion green, brass shades of blue, um, woodwind shades of purples and pinks, color guard reds. Um, I do that sometimes you can look out there and you can quickly distinguish like, okay, upper brass or light blue, lower brass or dark blue. If you need to group things real quickly. Um, sometimes I'll use the dots, sometimes I'll use letters depending on what band, band programs enjoy. Depending on the, the group you're writing for. Yeah, um, what they like. We have another question. Um, yep. How do you manage your time when writing for multiple groups simultaneously? Yes. <clears throat> Deadlines and things, you know. Light your hair on fire and hope for the best. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I. the number one thing I will say to all of you that are doing this, either for a living or for extra cash, is be honest with yourself and be honest with your clients. Um, I know so many people that fail at this because of timelines. Um, you know, because they, oh, I'll get that to you Friday. There's no way in hell you're getting to them on Friday. You know, so I, from my experience, I find best, I'm honest, you know, it's like, I can't get that for you Friday. I have three other sh productions I'm doing by Friday. I will get it to you Monday. But I'm honest with myself first, knowing what I can get done and then with them. Um, I think getting an idea of how fast you write is the key thing. Uh, and, and don't guesstimate, don't talk about your best writing day ever. Like I wrote a production in half of Saturday, I was done. And now I can write a production every half day. No, like be realistic. You know, for me in the fall, when I'm really in a groove and I'm really jamming, I can almost do a production a day. Sometimes it takes me a little bit more to tidy up and get all the notes on there and everything. Um, it's a really long production. It might be more, but that's kind of like, okay. And then, you know, and then, so I know in my falls, I do between 10 and 12 shows most falls because I know that that's what I can accomplish within my days. By the time I'm getting my 10th, my 10th ballot out, somebody's wanting a closer and I kind of get that for Right. Um, it, it gets, I, I feel like it gets easier when you get bands that are early starters, mm -hmm. um, which equals basically Texas only. Um, but there's, there's several of the big Texas bands that know, like right now, like I, I've written three minutes of LD Bell because they know what their numbers are going to be. So you get a jump start. So if, you know, if it was drum corps season, I would have a bunch of show written before I even went off the drum corps. Um, but I think, you know, scheduling, being honest and don't, don't, you know, don't flake on your own jobs. It's, it's your job, you know, right. so don't say I'm, I'm not, I'm writing the closer on Friday and be like, well, I'd rather go hang up the leg on Friday. Um, <laughs> you can't do that. But I think just honestly being first figuring out how fast you write and then be honest about that and, and account for all the other things. Like I got to eat dinner with family on sometimes and I got to go on a date sometimes and I got to sleep occasionally. Um, but you know, varying patterns. I certainly, I adjust my sleep patterns based on the air. There's times when, I'm super stressed, and if I'm sleeping three, four hours and I wake up, I'll just start writing at three, three four in the morning because I'm awake and I know I have to work to do. And then at 11 a.m., I take a nap for two hours. Uh, there's other days I get a good night's sleep and I'll work till three in the morning straight. So, you know, it's, it's finding what works for you, but um, being diligent, being honest. Just don't BS people. Everybody knows. Everybody knows when you're not telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> they know when they don't get a closer, too. And honestly, right. every banner would rather know, like, as much as they want to start the closer on Friday, they would rather know they're not going to have it and make a better plan than to right. think all week they're going to have it. And then Friday morning, you're like, hey, man, I didn't get it done. Right. Now they're scrambling to adjust their plan. So just try to be up front with that stuff. The domino effect. Yep. Um, we have a question from Scott. He's curious about the Blue Devils design process. How much is organic on the field and charted later or how much is charted ahead? Right. Um, you know, I purposely didn't talk about a bunch of that stuff because it is such a unique process. I'll, I'll tell you guys now, but... Uh, 
I told Dustin I didn't want to talk too much about that because I don't think it's a process that anybody else can really use. It's a process that's developed through the personalities that are there and the talent that's there. Mm -hmm. um, we stage a majority of it now is organically designed and then charted after the fact. Um, props are still charted like we have. We'll adjust them, but you know, like um, like what I showed you, we'll have prop charts because mm -hmm. um, those are you know super accounting. You have to be super accountable for that stuff is. But really, the blue is almost everything is designed organically. That works because the members all have experience. There's typically one member that doesn't have drum corps experience. Right. In addition to that, the entire visual staff rates drill. If we're going to hire somebody, they do this for a living. Now, some some drum corps, you know, don't have that luxury. You know, your your drill writer is a band director, or you know, they're they accountant and they just teach vis on weekends. Um, we have the we have the ability to. So anybody that we've hired for the last numerous years is a professional drill guy. So they stage, you know, they, they're not writing for the Blue Devils, but they do write for the Blue Devils because we'll be out there doing something, you know, and we'll just say, hey, you know, Peter, go organize the baritones, make it an arc. We'll be over in a second, you know, and then the, the staff divvies up that when we do things. Um, but that's because, honestly, we're all drill writers. I mean, the Blue Devils staff, Peter writes Mandarins. Um, I write Academy. Chris writes Troopers. Mm -hmm. James Gao was a Blue Devils, just left because he's writing Blue Knight. So it's like everybody is a drill writer. Right. So when we divide up and we do these sub projects, everybody has the skill set to quickly do this. Um, and then Jay and I just go around and we edit we're like, OK, that, you know, thanks for thanks for spending 20 minutes on that. Zach. That's not the idea. We're looking for. <laughs> you guys bring it in. Um, yeah. So and, and, and that process doesn't really work for a lot of people because you just don't have the kids to pull that off. And honestly, I think it's a little bit of a problem for Blue Devil Age out sometimes, too. They don't realize how much better their talented peers are than most groups they're going to go work with. And you got to kind of tone it back and be like, kids aren't going to understand if you just describe a visual phrase with words and then assume that they know what all those words mean on ballet positions and they can do it. It doesn't work that way. So. Uh, question from Nick. What is your most least favorite design trend? Maybe with you regarding <laughs> drums. Uh, my least favorite design trend is throwing drumsticks in a drum show and people applaud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the most idiotic thing. Like, seriously, like, you play like the hardest stuff ever and you're doing flips and you toss a drumstick to a guy 20 feet away and everybody goes. Um, <laughs> I, I can't say that. Um, favorite, I don't know. Um, God, I feel like I layer everything nowadays. People really like the layers. Um, I like the layers. You know, Pyware has up, updated their, their sequential tool quite a bit. I still wind up doing a lot of mine manually. Um, but layering things you know i feel like it, it adds a, a layer of interest um, i feel like people are trying to be um, more cohesive to what the musical score is you know it's funny that I, i'm gonna ramble but um you know we've all gotten used to forever 30 40 50 years you wrote a show and everybody starts everybody stops everybody starts everybody stops everybody starts everybody stops and the music is never written that way like really i mean the equivalent of that would be like bah, bah. You know, it's not that way. And I feel like people are more writing visual packages that are closely resembling musical packages. Like music, if, if voices are layering in, visual is layering in. If voices are layering out, visual is layering out. If if one section's featured, one section's halting and everybody else is moving. It gives shows a lot more through designed feel when you don't feel like it has to be all start, all stop. Um, the layering helps you with that and it helps you fill space. Um, it also feels more advanced, you know, if, if you can have the brass on a six page layered idea and within that there's sub events, there's a, woodwind, a, a little woodwind thing that's going on, the percussion's doing something here. Now you have multiple music and multiple visual ideas, which is, you know, more complex design ideas. So um, I really like layering things. So I do quite a bit of that. Uh, the, we have a question from Chad. I had this thought earlier. Do you use the production sheets or do you use only text boxes? No, I use production sheets. Um, I, I put text box on here, ironically. Um, I put text boxes on only when I'm writing information that's not generally gonna be seen by like kids or something like that. Okay. Uh, these I put on here, this sheet that I happen to have up here, I put these on, if you look on there, I, I used to teach a drill and would hate when you'd get to rehearsal and you couldn't remember if you had the updated drill charts or you didn't, you know what I mean? Like you change and you're like, are these are the drill charts from yesterday? Um, so I started putting these text boxes on here, this one, this, this sheet I have pulled up. And I put on there adjusted ADJ, and I put parentheses the date that I adjusted it, 
And then I read a quick sentence about who was adjusted. On this one was drum suggested eight steps forward and stay on yard lines. Move double time now. I did that so that I know that they're gonna look at that drill chart and be like, oh, this was adjusted. And then I look at it right like, oh, it was adjusted on October 16th. Do I have the most updated charts? Right. And you know what the adjustment was. So they're not like, wait, what is that? What, what's different? You know, they just look at me like, oh, the drum just pushed forward eight. So I, I do these little boxes out of my own habits of being at a rehearsal and not knowing. And I found that people really like that. Um, people like the arrows too, you know, indicating things and all the extra stuff you put on there is really helpful. Right. Um, this one, you can see also I have this gray thing along the back and along the sides. Their band practice field terrain isn't good there. They told me that. So I just put that so I don't chart in that gray area if I need to. Um, some of these other little dots over here are parking lot, a pole, a tree. In that <laughs> just things they told me. It's like, well, put them in there because I know when I'm writing that they're not going to want to run into the tree. Exactly, um, right? Yeah. We have, it looks like, one last question. That's Jeremy asks, uh, do you pre-establish delivery dates for each movement for each band or go on an as-needed basis based on communication? Dustin, can you hear me? I lost your sound. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Oh, anybody else can hear me. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I don't know what happened. Ah! I can see you. I can see your mouth moving. I see my voice. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I do use production sheets, though. Awesome. Uh, can you hear me now? I don't use all the things in the production sheet, but um, I put comments in. I started doing uh, notes one, two, and three, and I do these um, brass drum, brass garden drums are what I do. And these were great, Dustin. This, this, uh, this feature you guys did where these go down below the grid now, mm -hmm. oh man, that's golden. This is great. So yeah, I do use the production sheet for all, for all this stuff. Um, it's great. I, again, I didn't used to use this, but now I do use this and it's so helpful. I love that the information is down below. I try not to use text boxes now, especially with big right. bands and text boxes get in the way. Great. All right. I wish I could hear you, Dustin. Still no? Everybody I else can hear, hear you. <laughs> so, well, uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> y'all have a wonderful evening, and we'll see y'all tomorrow. Um, we'll be announcing the winner of uh, the uh, marching thanks, band. Thanks, Dustin. Call me if you need anything. Thank you, Jamie. We'll be marching, uh, announcing the uh, winner of the drum, <clears throat> sorry, the social distance drill challenge as well. So we'll see y'all tomorrow. Thank you again so much. Y'all have a great evening.